Hi everyone, welcome to our online Bible study. We are so glad that you're here with us today. I hope your week is going well. Um, don't forget, we have things coming up. We've got our Wednesday encouragement tomorrow. I always try to give updates, the latest updates uh, on the Wednesday encouragement, so be watching that. Hope that you will join us for prayer Sunday morning at 9.30 from wherever you are. We try to join together as a church family in prayer. If you need a prayer guide, we've got one on our website. It's right there. You can download it, and we encourage you to do that. And I hope you're taking advantage of our Lent devotions uh, every day, Monday through Saturday. We make those available to you on our website, our app, and our Facebook page. And so we, we encourage you to take advantage of those. On Wednesday, we, we kind of do it in video format on, on Facebook. And so if you'd like to, to see it in, in video format, uh, we do it that way on Facebook on Wednesdays. But same devotion as you get uh, uh, written on the, on the website and the app. Well, as we begin this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for... The, the blessings you give us of each day. And we thank you for, uh, for loving us and caring for us and giving us your word. And we just ask that through our time in your word today, that we would be encouraged and, and challenged that we might grow to serve you in a greater way. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You ever seen a child prodigy? I've always been fascinated by geniuses who can take college classes when most kids are in middle school and have advanced degrees by the time most kids finish high school, or kids who have a natural gift for music or for playing a particular instrument. Nowadays, you see kids who are naturals at writing code and developing software. And then there are the spiritual prodigies, the preaching prodigies. Here's a young man having to do school at home because of COVID who just seems born to preach, and he just doesn't want schoolwork to get in his way. Enjoy. Seven, four, the refining I to is unable to connect. So it's telling me Ramon Tigres, Ramon Tigres, you've been working hard and dedicated day in and day out, day and night. In the midnight hour, you're hurting your eyes by watching the school, trying to get the education. Trying to learn knowledge that you might not even use, but that's okay because I'm required. Can I get a witness if you say I'm required to watch it? I'm gonna reload the page and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Let's see, I'm on lesson 105, and it's playing, and it's playing, and it's playing, and it's playing. So what God telling you to do your work? And it's playing. No, he's still telling me to take a break. You see how he paused it? No, you paused it. You paused it. You better do your schoolwork. I didn't pause it. Oh, no, he just paused it, he just paused it, he just paused it, he just paused it. He I need just you to stop it. putting stuff on God, God, God yeah, didn't pause it. Yeah, Get over there and do your work. Mama. Ramon. You no, know, I don't want to do the work. <laughs> you better do that dog on work. You know, I don't want to do the work. Because God is doing the work in me. How am I supposed to be doing work when he's working in me? I need to rest so he has a stable foundation to upgrade on. How when I'm moving, how am I going to get upgrades? When a car is getting upgraded, it's in a garage and it's standing still. When a superhero is being upgraded, it's in a garage and it's standing still. Tell them about that oil. The oil, the oil, the oil, the oil, the oil, the oil, the oil that runneth over. 
the oil, the oil, the oil, the oil. The oil, the oil, the oil. You just wasted the two oil, minutes. Oh, oh my God. God. The oil that's dripping off of me. The oil that's dripping off of me is unexplainable. It's contagious. Guess what, Mama? You got the oil. <laughs> you hit me like that one more time. I'm going to knock you out. And, and God going to have to. And God going to have to help you. Ooh, you can tell that kid's got some preacher in him. Can I get an amen? I said, can I get an amen? Oh, y'all not hearing me. I'm going to preach till I hear someone through that computer. Can I get an amen? Whew. It's contagious. I'm glad God calls different people to preach differently because I'm absolutely exhausted just watching that kid. I may have to call a lid on the day and come back and teach next week. Let's pray and we'll close. No. Well, there are child prodigies in different areas. But as we're going to see today, Jesus was capable of amazing people with his spiritual understanding at a young age himself. Now, we left off last week with Mary and Joseph presenting Jesus at the temple as an infant. And Simeon and Anna got the privilege of seeing the Messiah before they died. Today, we're going to pick up with the only other account we have of Jesus' childhood. So we're in Luke chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 40. It says, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Now, this section that talks about Jesus in the temple is kind of bookended with the same basic thought about the physical, social, and spiritual growth of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. This is really the only glimpse we get of Jesus growing up years. There are a few apocryphal myths, most of which involve Jesus misusing his miraculous power in some way. But this is the only event that we have a reliable record of. One of the things we see through this is that throughout his life, Jesus' identity was always crystal clear. It was announced before his birth, at his birth, and, we under, and he understood it even in his youth. So let's go to verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, as we've said, Passover was one of the three festivals pretty much everyone in Israel who was able to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate, the other two being Pentecost and Tabernacles. The people who lived in Jerusalem would take them in, uh, those, those who were coming from other places, they would host them, and the food from the festivals was more than enough to keep everybody fed. Now, Jesus is 12 here, which means he is now considered a young man. And at this age, Jewish boys are expected to keep the law, to learn a trade, and to attend the Jewish feasts. This was for Jesus' first time in going to the temple. It was the first time he would see the sacrifices and all the money changers and the animals and all that was there. And you have to remember, especially for a boy from a small town like Nazareth, seeing something that huge, something that beautiful, had to be incredibly impressive. I remember talk, taking my son to Yankee Stadium, the old stadium, for his eighth birthday and, and how amazed he was. And that was without all the gold that was in the temple. So you can imagine how impressive that would have been to a kid. And it says, when the festival was over. But the literal tr the wording here is, when the days had been completed. The festival lasted seven days. But you were only required to be there for the first three. And a lot of people went on back after that. Some scholars say that the teachers Jesus was engaged with here wouldn't have been available after the entire festival was over, and that this suggests that Jesus' family left after the first three required days, but before the entire festival was over. We don't know for certain, but the circumstances suggest that that may be the case. Most folks from an area traveled in large groups of people, uh, people they knew, for safety's sake. And this was before the days of helicopter parenting. And a 12-year-old boy had a whole lot more freedom and independence. 
combined with the community-wide nature of the group, it's not difficult to understand how he could have been separated without them being worried. The men tended to hang together, and the women tended to hang with the other women. So, and the children kind of went around in, in, among themselves, and each one probably thought Jesus was with the other. And when night came, they realized that he wasn't with either one. It says, they began looking for him. And the word used here indicates a continuous, thorough search. Whenever I read this, I, I think of how many times this happened with my kids when they were little. Christy and I got to church on Sundays, and there usually was a while after the service was over, and the kids would play while they waited for us to get done. And we traveled separately back then because I usually came really early in the morning. Uh, there were several times where we would get home since we left, we came and left separately. There were times when both of us would get home and realize that the kids were still at church. Or someone would call us and tell us, and each of us thought that the kids were with the other one. Thankfully, we only live five minutes from the church building. But when you're looking for your child and you can't find them, that's a frantic time for a parent. I heard my mother-in-law tell the story of Christy getting separated from her in Rose's Dime store when she was little. At least 10 times I heard this story. With the residual terror still in her voice, and I didn't even meet Christy until she was 21, and it was still bothering her mom. So they're searching for him, frantically trying to find him, as you can imagine. Verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Three days. And imagine that. It was three days Jesus was apart from his parents. Because they had already traveled a day's journey from Jerusalem before they even realized he was gone. So it took a day to get back, that's two. And then the next day, sometime there, they found him. In the Jewish reckoning of time, that's three days because you always count the day you're on. And what he's, doing, what, what he's doing at the temple is he's listening to the teachers and he's asking them questions. And he was astonishing people with his knowledge and his spiritual insight. It says that everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers which means that he was asking intelligent questions that showed he had a deep understanding, and he was also answering questions from the teachers. They probably thought that they had the next great chief priest on their hands. What's interesting is that the high priest at this time was Annas, who would be the one who would try Jesus 21 years later. Makes you wonder if he was around to see and hear Jesus here, and if he ever realized that the one he was trying all those years later was that little boy back at the temple. We're not told, but it's just one of those things that's interesting to wonder. When finally, mom and dad find him. And if you have ever searched for a lost child, you know the competing emotions here. The overwhelming relief mixed with the desire to chew them out for not staying with you as you hug them so hard they can't get away from you again. They, they let him know that he had caused them pain. The word that's translated anxiously here is one that's associated with a sharp pain, and you can understand that pain. So how does Jesus respond? Well, that they should have known he would be in his father's house. Some translations say about my father's business. The Greek word can be translated either way. <clears throat> now, this is the key verse to this entire section, and there are three themes surrounding this verse. The first is that Jesus is the son of God. Mary calls Joseph his father, but he reminds her that God is his true father. So in the first recorded words we have of Jesus, he's affirming that he is the son of God. The second theme is that Mary and Joseph are amazed and confused by Jesus' response. That reaction will become common among people as his life and his ministry go on. We don't know if Joseph ever really understood Given that Jesus' siblings 
would think he was out of his mind at one point later on when he's an adult. It seems as if he might not have. Mary, though, would get more of a long-term, step-by-step understanding of things, even though she didn't fully understand it until after the resurrection. The third thing is Jesus being under divine directives. He says that it's necessary that he be in his father's house. While Jesus was obedient to Mary and Joseph, as we'll see in the next verse, he was committed to following God's will for him. And we see this mission focus throughout his ministry. Verse 51 says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And one of the amazing things about this passage is that it has Jesus affirming his deity, that he is the son of God. And yet it shows him humbly submitting to his imperfect parents. Think about how hard that had to have been at times. Most teenagers think they know more than their parents. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And yet he had the humility to submit to their authority. And he demonstrated that we can't obey God if we don't obey the authorities he's put in place. Scripture tells us that the earthly authorities are there because God put them there. Whether our parents, teachers, and school administrators, church leaders, police, elected officials, whoever. Even the Son of God submitted to the authorities God had established in his life. And Mary is there just soaking it all in. Scripture paints Mary as a very thoughtful woman. Not necessarily someone who spoke a whole lot, but someone who thought a lot and soaked things in. And the other bookend of the passage emphasizes the four different ways that Jesus grew. The first one it says is he grew in wisdom, intellectual growth. And notice that it's not just knowledge that Jesus grows in, but wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. Knowledge is being cognizant of facts. Wisdom is using those facts properly. I heard someone say one time that knowledge is realizing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. Wisdom is not putting one in a fruit salad. Now, I have no knowledge about such things, but it it seems to make sense. Knowledge is having such an awareness of the rules of grammar as to know that your boss it completely is grammatically incorrect in nearly everything he says. Wisdom is knowing not to point it out unless there's a compelling reason. Knowledge is realizing something is permissible. Wisdom is realizing that there are times when it's best not to do it anyway. So it says he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. That's physical growth. He grew up, grew up physically healthy. The third is that he grew in favor with God. That's spiritual growth. He grew in his relationship with the Father throughout his years on earth. And then fourth is favor with men. And that's social and relational growth. He developed healthy relationships with the people around him. And that's basically all we have on Jesus until he's 30 when he hands over his carpenter's tools to his brothers and meets John the Baptist to be baptized and begin his ministry. Now we move to Jesus' adult years, when he's ministering in his home region of Galilee. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 14. It says, Luke, as Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Now, Jesus had been in Judea, and again, this is, this is uh, he, as an adult, as he is in, into his ministry early on, and Jesus had been in Judea, but had left for Galilee for a couple of reasons. One, he was getting pressure from the Pharisees, and that was pressure that was going to be ongoing, but he's starting to feel that pressure. Another was that John the Baptist had been thrown in prison by Herod. And so there's an additional pressure from the government, basically, uh, to get him. And then verse 14 indicates that a third was the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, in John's gospel, we're told of a couple of encounters on the way there with the Samaritan woman and then the healing of the royal official son. 
And those things show that Jesus ministered to all different kinds of people. And Jesus' message, according to Mark's gospel, was the same as John the Baptist's message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it says the people rejoiced over his message. They praised him up and down. To them, that meant that their days of living under the thumb of the Romans were coming to an end. And so naturally, they were excited. And now he's heading back to his hometown of Nazareth. So let's look at verse 16. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So at this point, Jesus has been away from Nazareth for about a year. He's been baptized by John, tempted in the wilderness, turned the water to wine in Cana, cleansed the temple the first time during the Passover, recruited his disciples, and he's been teaching and performing miracles. But most of that had been in Judea and in the area surrounding, and now he's in the area surround, of, of Nazareth. Uh, he had done some of his work in that area near Nazareth, but this is his first time back home. And Jesus' regular practice was to be at the local synagogue each week. It's a great example for us uh, that, that when we're able to, when we're, when we're physically able to, that we need to take advantage of that opportunity. For Jesus, this wasn't just a common practice, but it gave him a chance to teach because it was the custom that visiting rabbis were allowed to get up and speak. And I'm sure at first it was a nice welcome home. You know, the rabbis probably introduced him by telling stories of how he had had all the answers growing up in Sabbath school. He was a captain of their undefeated Bible Bowl team. You know, all that stuff welcoming him home. And what would happen is that the day the speaker that would stand up to read the scripture, then he would sit down to teach. And that's what Jesus did. At the end of the message, there would be a Q&A session with him as well. Jesus chose a passage from Isaiah 61 with a little bit of chapter 58, verse 6 inserted, which many understood to be speaking about the Messiah. Verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And everything's good to this point. He has everyone's attention. It says their eyes were fastened on him as he sat down to start teaching. And then came the part that amazed them, verse 21. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now it's hard for us in 2021 to understand just how audacious this sounded to the people in the synagogue. This was a prophecy that was understood to be about the Messiah. And Jesus was saying that it has been fulfilled in him. And so by saying that this prophecy was fulfilled in him, he was basically claiming to be the Messiah. He was doing it subtly, but that was the, that's what it meant. And he's just getting warmed up. This was just the opening line of the sermon. And unfortunately, we don't have the rest of it. But it generated, whatever he said after that, it generated a reaction. Verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Isn't this the kid we watched running around like crazy when he was a kid? Preacher's kids, elder's kids. Well, we don't know if Joseph was, was an official in the synagogue, but uh, they knew Jesus. And they say, isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you'll tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, 
that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine in the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So at first people are amazed at his teaching. The NIV translation says that they spoke highly of him, but the literal translation is they testified about him, which doesn't specify that they really approved of him, just that they attested to what he said. When combined with the word amazed, it indicates that it's not actual faith. In other words, people were talking about Jesus, but they weren't really committed to Jesus. His preaching had impressed them, but they're not endorsing what he's saying. They were saying, is that really Joseph, the carpenter's son? Wow, we didn't expect him to be able to preach like that. And Jesus knew that there was something else on their minds. Jesus knew that what they really wanted from him wasn't teaching as much as it was for him to heal people the way he had done in the surrounding areas like Capernaum because word had gotten round. And so he says, well, I guess you're going to quote the physician heal thyself proverb to me to try to get me to do miracles here that I've done in Capernaum. And Jesus says, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And that would be proven later in this and then the next time he comes to his hometown, which would also be his last time there, as he wasn't able to do any miracles because of their lack of faith. And that proverb has a lot of truth, doesn't it? It's the perception that someone from outside the area is more likely to be an expert or have the answers. I worked for a professional speaker years ago, and he lived and worked out of the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. And when he spoke outside of the area, he would have them introduce him as being from Norfolk. But whenever he spoke locally, he would always make sure that the introduction would list him as being from St. Louis, which was his hometown. Later, when he moved to Orlando, he did the same thing. He was from Orlando when he spoke in other parts of the country. And he was from St. Louis when speaking in Orlando. Now, it wasn't dishonest. Most people consider themselves to be from both the place they were born or grew up and from the place where they live, if that's a different place. It's all perception. A local guy doesn't get the respect that someone from out of town does. And, and that was true of Jesus, too. And then he illustrates what he's saying by citing two prominent prophets in Israel's history, Elijah and Elisha. Jews had rejected Elijah, so he was sent to help a Gentile widow. The Jews had rejected Elisha, and so he healed a Gentile with leprosy. And this would kind of be a pattern for Jesus' ministry. He would be rejected by those who you would think would accept him. He would be rejected by those who were closest to him spiritually. And then he would take his message to the downtrodden, the overlooked, and the despised. People such as tax collectors. We see the same thing in the early days of the church. The gospel is preached to the Jews first, but after many rejected it, it was taken broadly to the Gentiles. Verse 28 goes on, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So this was the last straw. When the people heard this, Scripture says they were furious. I mean, how could Jesus speak well of Gentiles? and imply that they could have more faith than they did. We're, we're God's chosen people here. Mark Moore says that they have been raised to believe that God had created Gentiles to fuel the flames of hell. Paul would later get in trouble for this same teaching. And this next part is something I, I wish I could have seen. They took him up to the top of a cliff, and, and they want to throw him off, but somehow he just walked through the crowd and went on his way. It doesn't say exactly how that happened. Did God freeze them so that he, they, they couldn't move and grab him? We're not given the details. Again, another one of my questions for when I get to heaven. But what we do know is that they couldn't take Jesus' life. There would be other times when people would try to grab him and harm him, but they couldn't do it. He could only choose to lay his life down. And that's what he would do when the time was right. Let's pray together as we close. 
Lord, we thank you for the fact that Jesus laid down his life for us. No one could take his life, but he willingly surrendered it because he loved us so much. And Father, uh, we, we pray that, that you would impress that on us so that we have the kind of gratitude that responds with a life of faith and a life of service. And we, we thank you for loving us that much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time. <music>